Happy birthday! We're gonna have a birthday today. Uh huh. We're in Luke <laughs> chapter one, and we get this wonderful, wonderful birthday. You know, Luke. We had our introduction last week to him, uh, a doctor, a missionary doctor, uh, with Paul the apostle, um, an artist. Uh, we looked at how much he pays attention to detail, the songs and the prayers and everything that he records, a historian. You could even um, kind of paraphrase his introduction. If you remember from last week, it's all in high classic Greek because he is a doctor. He's a learned man. But in the street, he just wants us to know. He says, Dear lover of God, by my careful investigation, seeking to set in order a declaration of those things which are so readily believed among us, I myself interviewed all the witnesses, and when I had made a careful scrutiny of all the facts, guided from above, I sat down in writing this good news, that your faith may be more certain in regard to those things that you have been instructed. And that's why we're here, just to build and bolster our faith and rejoice and sing that song of the redeemed. And so, uh, Lord willing, we will do that. You know. Uh, last week we had the introduction to uh, a, a couple. They were righteous and blameless. They walked in the ways and the ordinance of God. They were priests from the priestly line of Aaron. And Zacharias got to go up to the temple. And when he was in there offering incense, he had this encounter with the angel Gabriel. And he, Gabriel told him that uh, to him was going to be born a son. His prayers are answered. You know, and they're well advanced in age, beyond the age of childbearing, and yet these prayers they had prayed their whole life are now going to come true. And in that, I think it's beautiful, the name uh, Zacharias means Yahweh remembers, and the name Elizabeth means an oath of God. And together, Yahweh remembers the oath of God. As we went to Malachi uh, chapter 4, the last chapter in your Bible of the Old Testament, we read in Malachi... Four or five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And this is being fulfilled now. This is answer to prayer. Not just Zacharias' prayer, but all the nation of Israel and literally every person who's ever walked the face of the earth that just cried out, Lord, help me. And God answers, help is on the way. And so as we jump then into chapter 1, we came up through the announcement, and then remember Zacharias was struck um, deaf and dumb, couldn't speak because he didn't quite believe that good news, and he went out and had to do sign language, and uh, when he got back home, he tells Elizabeth, you're going to have a boy, or you're going to have a child, right? Um, and then, in fact, these things come to pass. And so she hid herself, it said, for five months. And now we pick up at verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, as we look at these truths, this good news that's been accurately recorded and passed down to us, help us, Lord, receive these words. I pray that this good seed would find good soil, and Lord, it would take root and grow in our hearts, and we would know you, and we would show you to the world in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here we are in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, so this is the sixth month, um, and this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Okay, so that's what the references do. And uh, this angel, Gabriel, he's a messenger of God. That's literally what the word angel means when you read in your Bible. Angel, that's the word angelos. But it means messenger. That's what the primary function of angels is, is to deliver messages from God. And so this angel comes, and uh, he, he now comes to Nazareth. 
Nazareth. And he visits Joseph and Mary. And uh, we see that there's this betrothal that's going on of, to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Let's take a little bit and unpack this. It's going to take a little bit to unpack it, and then we'll get our we'll get going. We'll really start picking up speed here. But this Nazareth, it's not recorded anywhere in the Old Testament. You're not going to find it recorded. It's fundamentally pretty insignificant. I remember when we first uh, were asked to come up to Idaho to start a church. We were living in the Philippines, and we were in our, our sala, our living room, and uh, our pastor over the Skype says, when you get back from the Philippines, we'd like to send you up to Minidoka to start a church. Minidoka, Idaho. And so I got off the phone with him, and I went to Google Earth, and I found Minidoka, Idaho. Some of you may have found it, but not if you blink, because if you blink, you're going to miss it. You know? And, and I called him back, and I said, what have I done to get sent to Minidoka, Idaho? He says, I think it's Minidoka County, right? So, well, Nazareth is very much like that, insignificant. It would have been a working class town in the days of Joseph and Mary. Um, it was basically off the map. It was not along any major roads or anything like that. The only things noteworthy about Nazareth that we can really say, one of them um, in about the, is a thing called the Nazarene Decree. This came from Claudius Caesar. It was carved on a marble tablet and found in Nazareth. Um, it's dated about 44 to 50 A.D., okay, in the same time frame we talked about when Luke is writing these things down. Um, and in this decree, it's interesting, Caesar in Rome is writing to the people in the Galilee region against defiling tombs, okay? No grave robbing. And it's rather interesting with the Jews being all disgruntled over Jesus and that kind of stuff, uh, his resurrection and the tomb is empty. Then we get this one little bit of information excavated from Nazareth that Caesar Augustus paid enough notice to them that he wrote a rule, anybody caught digging graves will be executed. So it's capital punishment to do that. Um, apparently they were really trying to quash this story that was going all around the world. Um, it's near, and the excavations show, uh, a Roman city by the name of Sepphoris. And Sepphoris was a kind of a seat of government, especially a garrison for Roman soldiers, and just a couple of miles away from Nazareth. And it's full of magnificent stone structures, buildings, and that kind of a stuff. And it would have required workers. And the speculation is that a lot of this workforce, this labor force to build Sepphoris, came from Nazareth. One of the things that's interesting in all of this is as we study the life of Joseph, we don't know much about him either. But what most of us do, if I said, what significant thing can you tell me about Joseph? What would you say? Carpenter. Carpenter. I heard carpenter, right? We've all been raised to think he's a carpenter. The Bible technically says he's a technos or a technon. Okay, technon means craftsman. Okay, and that would be a carpenter, but it also includes stonemason. And likely, Joseph was part of the labor pool that helped build Sepphoris and this big colony. And so, when we think of uh, Jesus and Joseph and, and working with wood, that's, that's surely accurate, but you could expand it to more of a tradesman, a, a guy who can do all kinds of things like that. So there's Sepphoris near uh, Nazareth. Another thing that's rather not good is uh, Nazareth was known by some of the secular writings of their day of being a community of very poor morality. And one of the problems with it was because there was this large Roman garrison not very far away, Nazareth was known for brothels and pubs, if we would put it in the vernacular. And so that's where the Roman soldiers went to party. And uh, that's where they could get what they came looking for. You, you know, in, in John, in chapter 1, when Philip comes to Nathanael and says, we found him, the one the scriptures speak about, the Messiah. Remember in John 1 and verses 45 and 46, and what is Nathanael's answer? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's about the best you can say about Nazareth. Can anything good come out of it? And, and, and truly, we see uh, in uh, four, chapter 4 of Luke here coming up, Jesus is going to be rejected from the synagogue in Nazareth. 
But, that's then. Today, Gabriel comes to Nazareth. If you feel like you're rejected, maybe you've been morally chewed up and spit out, maybe you feel insignificant, maybe your life doesn't really seem to be on the map, perfect. You're right in line for a visit from God this morning. Okay? So Gabriel comes to visit, um, and we see uh, these people. Joseph, we've mentioned a little bit, and Mary. Mary the Virgin, it mentions here. What do we know about Mary? We, we, we can see that Joseph and Mary are betrothed, okay? And just so that you understand, in the Jewish culture, the way that they would go about getting married, there were several stages in what we would call the marriage. The first stage is the engagement. And the engagement can happen even back in childhood. It's usually performed by families, and it's a pledge that they make that their children will get married someday. But generally, it's usually arranged by the father at the very least, even if it's not when they're small. That's called the engagement. And that could go on a great part of your life, okay? Uh, somewhat like courtship, possibly in today's culture, if you know people that court in today's culture. Um, but then you come to the more formal aspect of marriage, betrothal, and um, the actual consummation of the marriage, the marriage uh, celebration. Now, the betrothal, that's the word kiddushah. The kiddushah is the point where it's official. You are now legally bound, okay? And in order to become unbound, you must get a legal divorce. But during the time of the kiddushah, the being set apart and made holy, that usually lasted about a year. And during that year, um, the, the groom and the, and the bride-to-be could not have any physical contact. They, they actually spent very little time together at all. And if they did, it would be strictly chaperoned to make sure that no hanky-panky went on. And the reason that it was about a year is to make sure that no hanky-panky went on, right? And there would be no child. And so, okay, they're, they're good. They're, they're, they're sealed. The Kiddushah is complete. Then you come to the Chupah. The Chupah is the wedding ceremony. That's where the bridegroom comes like a shout in the night, and everybody goes, and they go to this big seven-day feast where the wedding is consummated. And then they become married. But you could technically get divorced any time before that. And it's even possible that you could have a divorced virgin. Or you could have a virgin widow. If the husband died prior to the chuppah and the consummation of marriage, that woman is still legally married and she's a widow and she's a virgin. That might unravel a couple passages in the scripture that you've read before, this, you know, widow that's a virgin. That kind of explains that, okay? So this is the circumstances that we find Joseph and Mary in. Um, and we know that uh, not only is she betrothed, are they um, legally bound to each other, we also know she was very youthful. And culturally from those days, and we don't have an exact age, but in those days, marriage usually occurred somewhere between 13 and 17 years old. That was the lion's share of the marriages, somewhere in that cluster. I remember um, when I was uh, of marriage age, it was somewhere down in the 20s. As some of you remember, it was like right after high school, right? And the cultural norms shift in times and seasons with the culture. But in, in the Jewish culture, um, when they were of childbearing age, that's often the time that they would get married. And it was perfectly normal, nothing um, wrong with that. Um, and it's rather interesting, side note on all of this, you may never have thought about this, but Jesus himself, he led a youth movement in his day. Okay, Jesus himself was in his early 30s when he was crucified. John the Baptist, his cousin, basically same age, his disciples. You know, you get these pictures, maybe you've seen them, of these uh, apostles, or maybe you've seen statues, right? And they're all noble figures in a robe, and often they have a long beard, maybe they've got a bald pate, you know, and they look wrinkled and, and distinguished. But most of the disciples were young people. 
And this was a youth movement, a lot of it. So, you know, what does Paul say to Timothy? He says, let no one look down on your youth, right? You live a good and righteous life, and let people judge you by the content of your character, not your age, okay? So she's young, she's youthful, um, and she's humble. And we're going to see a lot of this come out as we go further through this chapter in her prayer and his response to the message from Gabriel. And uh, she no doubt grew up in a relatively modest environment, save for the notoriety of the city of Nazareth. Um, she would have been in a very, very small town. And often in those situations, you, come up you grow up close to the earth without all the um, things that can sometimes pull somebody away. She was very humble, we'll see this. And clearly she was a virgin. Um, and it's interesting, not only does uh, Gabriel note that she's a virgin, uh, Matthew, the gospel writer, says she's a virgin. Luke here will call her a virgin. Joseph will call her a virgin. And so will Mary herself. I have not been with the man, okay? And so that's pretty clear. She's highly spiritual. We'll get to that one as we unpack her song in a little bit here. But she was totally tuned in to God. And this is just something that's so excellent. We look at young people. And often, many of you probably can think of, in that young season of life, how we often are quite idealistic. And if you've been raised in a home where you know God, man, you can just be on fire for the Lord, super spiritual for the Lord, super deep in the Lord. And I love it when we see young folk come into the fellowship here. And we, you know, we, you notice those people. And it's like, man, we, we need to do everything we can to rally behind them and, and just make sure they have opportunity to walk out their faith. She was very, very spiritual. Um, and she was of royal lineage. She was of the tribe of Judah, of the Lion of Judah. She was a descendant of King David. We'll see that later. Uh, as we get into further chapters, we'll see that genealogy lay out. So we know a lot about Mary, a lot more than we know about Joseph. And uh, in verse 28 through 30, we read, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of reading this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found grace. You have experienced God in his fullness as he just wants to bless you. It says rejoice. That word rejoice is kairos, which, from which we get the word in our modern vernacular, cheers. Okay, literally, that's the translation. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, welcoming greeting. Cheers! And it says, highly favored one. I love that highly favored one. I think I mentioned it last week in Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 6. When we go through this list of spiritual blessings that God has given you and God has given me. And what we have in our spiritual bank account, one of the things that we have in Verse 6 of Ephesians 1 is that we are accepted in the Beloved. That He accepts you. He has received you. You said, Jesus, I, I, I want you in my life. I want all that I have from you. And He says, accepted. You're mine. Come on in. That's the same word as um, it says here, highly favored one. You are highly favored in the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? This is it's a beautiful thing. And this is how he starts off, right? And I can imagine, remember Zacharias as he's offering incense and prayer and smoke's filling the room. And bam, there's the angel Gabriel. Whoa, what are you doing here? He says, don't be afraid, right? And so what do we see here? He, she's, he says, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of reading this was, okay? Or agitated, you might be able to say. You could even say she was freaking out, okay? Might be more of a way of we might say it today. Well, 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 I don't quite understand what's going on here. There's an angel, and he says that I'm highly favored, and I'm blessed among women. Wow, okay? Now, in all of this, I just want to bring to your attention her reaction to Gabriel's message, and then what we saw in 
Zacharias' reaction to Gabriel's message. Remember, Zachariah kind of went down the path of doubt and, and not really quite sure, what sign are you going to give me that I know this is true? But we see with Mary, while she is agitated, she's freaking out, she's troubled, but she's accepting it. And this is something I think that's rather interesting. Here's the high priest in the tabernacle offering prayers for the nation of incense in the holy place. And he's got his doubts. And here's a young girl who's just on fire for the Lord. Humble, spiritual. She meets the angel and she just says, wow. Wow. Which one of that, of those are, am I? Which one of those are you? When we meet Jesus in our day-to-day -day walk, as we see him answer prayers, as we watch God move amongst ourselves, are we the kind of people that stand back and go, how do I know it's God? Or are we the kind of people that's like, man, that's my Jesus. That's my Jesus, right? This is Mary. And, and it's, it's amazing what she's going through in all of this. Highly favored one. Uh, blessed amongst women, and I will say this, and probably just a, a quick glance, it's funny how the church has treated Mary now down through all the years. I would have to say the Roman Catholic Church has overstated the place and position of Mary, right? Now, up to the point of, of labeling her the co-redemptrix, that she's got a part in redeeming mankind, just like Jesus. She's part of that. Or the mediatrix. She can mediate between you and Jesus. Oh, just go to Mary. Mary will make sure that Jesus answers the prayer for you. Or um, the advocate, that, that she can advocate to God on your behalf. Now, clearly, these are things that came into the Roman Catholic Church. They have since been diluted, diminished, um, Deny, they would say, we don't really believe that she's actually on par or equal with Jesus, who is God. But they venerate her to a position uh, extreme above, uh, above all peoples, above the apostles and everybody else. Well, on the other side of that, the Protestant church, we have not done a very good job of really honoring her. Blessed among women. Okay? Only two ladies get that title in the Bible. Um, the other one is J.R. in the Old Testament. I won't take you there. But nevertheless, this is, this is a profound honor that she is blessed amongst all women. And, and there's room and place to admire and recognize this young woman. This, this girl and her great faith and her great love and her great joy. It's something to be emulated. It is a good thing. And uh, we should recognize Mary as who uh, she is, who the Bible says that she is. Um, you have found favor with God. I just love that. Um, 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father's David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wow! Wow! This is amazing news. You're going to be the mother of the king of Israel, this thing that, that they've been waiting for forever and ever and ever, son of the highest. Okay, that's a, that's a term for son of God. Um, he will rule on the throne of David. Wow, this, this girl from this insignificant place, this young lady, what a high honor, what a high privilege. You're familiar with these passages in Isaiah, in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government... This is what it's talking about, the throne of David. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. And she would understand this. As Gabriel is telling her, he's going to sit on the throne of David. This is talking about her baby right here. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
prince of peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you can imagine, she's familiar with the scriptures, as we're going to see here. She gets all this. It's amazing what's going on. This prophecy that's being fulfilled, it was given, we read about it in 2 Samuel 7.14, where Samuel tells David what we call the Davidic covenant. The vow that God made, that there will be a descendant to sit on the throne of David forever and ever. And here, now, Gabriel's saying, it's going to happen, and you're going to be mother of that young man. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, or how shall this be? I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Amazing, again, in this announcement that Gabriel's bringing to her. How can this be? Now, without a doubt, she's asking a biological question. She says, How can this be? For I have not been with a man. She understands the birds and the bees. And in a rural culture like we live in, you know, we got 4-H, we've got the sheep showing and the, all this stuff going on this next couple of weeks. People know that. They get the basics. But she knows basically, I haven't been with a man. So how is this going to happen? She has a biological question. I think it's interesting that Gabriel answers with a theological answer. Okay? And kind of something fun to unpack and unriddle a little bit this. Uh, in this, um, since I do not know a man, and remember, who's writing this? Dr. Luke, who has made a thorough investigation, asked all the questions, and now is recording it that we may know the certainty of the things that were being taught, okay? So there's a little weight in what's going on in this conversation as we, we hear it. Um, and the angel answered said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And so he answers with a theological answer. Now, just to straighten a couple things out in this passage right here, we're talking about a miraculous conception. This is not the normal way of conceiving a child. We just saw last week another miraculous conception with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Although they used the normal biological mechanics, they were well beyond childbearing age, and yet God blessed them, and they had a child. When they shouldn't have, that would be miraculous. But this is miraculous on a whole different order of magnitude, okay? This is not just because she's old or like Anna who was praying at the temple that she could have a baby and, and uh, God answered her prayer. The baby was Samuel, the prophet, right? As you remember the answer to that prayer. But those are, there's miraculous conceptions, but this is not immaculate conception. You may have heard that term. Again, I'm not choosing to pick on a church per se, but I would say the Roman Catholic Church has held sway for the better part of 2,000 years. And a lot of what we know or what we think we know or what floats around in the culture has come out of that church. And one of the thoughts of people that don't even know a whole lot about the Bible, they've, they've heard of the Immaculate Conception, okay? Now, just to be clear, the Immaculate Conception deals with the sinless conception of Mary and Jesus. Uh, and we know, that David writes, that I was conceived in sin. That we all, every person, every one of us as human beings, we come into the world with a sin nature, okay? And we are not immaculate. Mary was not immaculate. Um, Pope Pius, in the 1850s, he came out with this decree that somehow God gave her a special dis dispensation that she was without sin and therefore worthy to have the Son of God. But... Clearly, she was a sinner, just like everybody else. It was not an immaculate conception. And also, the idea of immaculate conception goes on to state 
that she remained a virgin perpetually. So even though she was with child, um, she somehow was a virgin. And even though she had many other sons and daughters, they would teach that she was still a virgin, all of which is easily verified as not quite right. Uh, one of the things in this that's also interesting, okay, um, is that in this, we see that it's the Holy Spirit overshadowing her that it enables this to happen, okay? Um, Erisiscado is the word. I just bring that up because this word overshadowing, it means to be enveloped as in a cloud, completely just enwound in a cloud. And uh, it's very much, it's a picture of what we see in the Old Testament of the Shekinah glory of God as it would sometimes just descend in the very presence of God, His glory, His Shekinah, His Shekinah glory, which is filled like the tent of meeting. And when Moses came out, he was glowing from being in the presence of God as, as, as we saw that here. And this is power of the Holy Spirit to... Um, causes to envelop her or to invest her with a preternatural influence to kind of change things. One thing that's really interesting in all of this too that I think is kind of cool is in this we get a little bit of a glimmer as to what we read in Philippians in chapter 2, a very familiar passage to many people. But I want to read it, and I want you to think just a little bit about Jesus and his role in what's happening right now. Because he's God from all eternity, not created, always was, is, and always will be. But there was a time in history, a time in eternity, where he stepped out of eternity into our world. It says in verse 7 of the Philippians chapter 2, but made himself of no reputation. That's the word echinosis. He emptied himself. T made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, and we know this, God has also highly exalted him, given the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. That's the name Gabriel said. You would call him every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? The Word of God comes and says you're going to have a child. The Spirit comes and enfolds her, overwhelms her, and the Son of God does something miraculous in that being God and not considering it robbery to be equal with God, he empties himself. He divests himself of all of his di diverse or divine prerogative. And then something really amazing happens in that there is this conception that occurs in Mary. Now, to be clear, um, Mary was a virgin, okay? Uh, we read in Isaiah um, 7, in Isaiah 7, 14, a sign that God gave. He said, uh, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? And fantastic Christmas message, right? Behold, this is going to be the sign. A virgin's going to conceive. And I'm thinking, isn't that how it works like all the time? Virgins conceive? What kind of a sign is that? Obviously, it's not a sign if it doesn't point to God. That would just be common. So what's happening here is something that's not uncommon. And a lot of liberal theologians will say, aha, gotcha. That word virgin, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son in Isaiah. That word virgin is the Hebrew word alma. And alma, while it can mean uh, a young woman who has had no sexual relations, it also could just mean a maiden, anybody of a very young age. And so see, uh, she probably wasn't a virgin. This is what the liberal theologians will say. 
They'll even cite cases in history where people claim to have been born of a virgin. Alexander the Great, there's a story that runs around that he was born of a virgin. And I'm sure that's been tried by a lot of women trying to explain to mom and dad what happened. <laughs> but you want to bear it out. Let's look at the life history and see where it goes from here. Another interesting thing about this, in, in talking about this um, virgin birth, do you understand or do you know, maybe you haven't heard this, but Muslims, okay, reading from the Quran, believe in the virgin birth of Isa al-Masih. That's the name for Jesus the Messiah, okay, in the Arabic, Isa al-Masih, recorded 17 different places in the Quran, and Mary is the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran, and they believe in the virgin birth, and then when they believe in the miracles, they believe in the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And what's so bizarre is you put these two together, and we find Muslims defending the virgin birth from the liberal theologians who have no ground to stand on. And it, it's just, it's kind of interesting how these things have all come together historically. There's a thing called Parthenogenesis, Parthenogenesis, okay? And that's where a being um, is able to replicate itself or create another out of itself. It comes with this word Parthenos. Parthos is the word for virgin, somebody that is uh, without sexual relationships. When we go to that passage in Isaiah chapter 7, the virgin self-conceived, and they say Alma, something interesting happened about 250 B.C., before Christ. A bunch of uh, scholars got together in Alexandria, Egypt, and they took all of the Hebrew scriptures and they translated them into Greek because now the Greek empire was growing and they wanted everybody to be able to read the Bible, the Old Testament. So they translated into Greek, and when they translated the word Alma, they used the word Parthenos. Maybe you've heard of this structure, this temple, that you can go visit today with these huge columns called the Parthenon in Greece, okay? That was a temple to the virgins, okay? Parthenos means virgin. So there's this biological condition called parthenogenesis, where an amoeba, maybe some kind of plants, some very lower orders are able to reproduce without having that exchange of... Um, information, that data, right, that we look at. But here we have something that's not parthenogenesis, Mary just conceiving in of herself. It says the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And what we probably could title it better would be pneuma genesis. Pneuma is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit originated, the Holy Spirit created in this. And this, I talk about Jesus emptying himself, right? And it's kind of interesting. Jesus emptied himself in Philippians 2 7, and he became the. Now, I'm just, I wrote this down. I made this up, okay? So you can argue with me all day long and say, yeah, whatever. But it's rather interesting. If you know anything about how people are made, there's these two cells, okay? They're called gametes. They only have half the chromosome mode, there's not enough to make a human being. And the gametes need to come together. Jesus emptied himself and became the gamete, quote, the seed of the woman that we read about throughout the Old Testament. And he entered the gamete, the egg of Mary, and together they became the zygote, okay? Which is now all the genetic information to be a human being, and yet by God. It's, he's fully God, scientifically, um, the, the theology on it, and he's fully human. Fully God, fully human. In fact, what does Gabriel say? He shall be called the Son of God. And any Jew reading this in those days, even the Greek world, would understand. What you're saying is this guy's deity. He's God. He's eternal God, and yet somehow this God, who was with God, who was God, was manifest, and we now held this glory, full of grace and truth. Is that what you're trying to tell me? That's exactly what we're trying to say right here. This is the miraculous conception of Jesus Christ. And so, 
uh, kind of fun in that way. I, I hope I didn't overwhelm you with too many details or facts. And yet at the same time, even if it just, you have to go back and listen to the tape or whatever, um, this is stuff we should know. Was, did, you, did they teach this to you? Did they teach this to you when you went to school? Was this in your biology class? Was this in your sex ed class? Because this is <laughs> revolutionary. It changes the whole world. And it explains a lot of things that the world just isn't interested in or doesn't want to hear. And yet there it is, front and center. Luke has gone to all the trouble to make sure that we can see it clearly. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is born to you will be called the Son of God. You will name Him Jesus, Gabriel says. Jesus, okay? Jesus is uh, the, from the Greek, Yesu, but from the Hebrew, as Mary and Joseph would have known them, Yehoshua, or the contraction, Yeshua. Yehoshua means... Yahweh is salvation. And Yeshua simply is a contraction that means the word salvation. That's Jesus' name. He is. That's what we say. When we say Jesus, say Jesus. Jesus. You just said salvation. You're just declaring God's plan to the whole planet. When we use his name, the name that is above all names, the name by which no other name may people be saved, right? When you say that name, you're declaring God is salvation every time you use his name. Verse 36. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and now this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. Remember, she kept herself away for five months. It's the sixth month. Gabriel's coming to visit Mary, telling her this wonderful news. Verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. I love that. And ultimately... That's the definition of God. God, God. With God, nothing is impossible. How do you describe God? There's so many ways to go about describing God. But one of the things is, with God, all things are possible. You can't say that about anything else in the universe. Everything else in the universe is finite. Everything else in the universe is temporal. Everything else in the universe eventually comes to an end. But with God, there is no beginning. There is no God end. And everything with God is possible. Wonderful declaration for God. Nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. That's humility. That's massive humility. And you know, I would pray that's my heart. Have you ever been to church some Sunday morning and you hear a word of, from God? Not because I'm so clever or whatever, but we're reading the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is here. He speaks to your heart. And you know, you've heard a word from God. What's your response? What is our response to the word of God? Here she says, Behold the maidservant, the doulos, the bond slave. I'm yours. Always have been. You created me. <laughs> Always will be. You say it, I do it. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. I love that. Calling out and recognizing this is God all the way. Yahweh God, the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I pray that's my heart. Let it be to me. Let it be to us according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And when she said that, she's saying a whole lot more than, okay, I'll be the uh, uh, one who brings the Son of God into the world. Sure, I'll be the one who sits on the throne of David. You know, I, I can't help but think of... Uh, James and John's mother goes to Jesus and says, could you grant it, or they go to her, and she's wondering, can you grant it that my sons will sit on the right and left hand? He's like, you don't know what you're asking, right? And here, fundamentally, Gabriel's telling Mary, you're going you're gonna to be that. You're going to be the mother 
of the Son of God, the Most High, the Holy One, the, the ruler from the throne of David. What an amazing thing. And you say, well, okay, sounds like a good deal, sign me up. But there's more to the story than that. A young woman, betrothed, legally engaged, virgin, with child, faces all kinds of scorn, all kinds of ridicule. For the rest of her life, she'll be called an adulteress. For the rest of her child's life, he will be called a bastard. For the rest of her life, however short it may be, she could be stoned to death for adultery. Or at the very least, she would be an outcast for the rest of her life. I've got good news for you, though. Jesus is here. And Jesus wants to enfold you and overshadow you and fill you and come to live in you and be manifest in you that your light would shine and the world would see that it's God. Good deal, right? But do you understand what the world is going to say? This is what Mary is acceding to. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be. Come what may. Let the chips fall where they may. What am I going to say? You've said it all, God. Let me just be obedient in that. Verse 31. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Okay, so six months for Elizabeth, first month for Mary. She's like, what is she going to do? I've got this news. I don't know what to do with it. I can't explain it. What, where can I go? <gasps> oh, yeah. My cousin, my blood relative, right? Elizabeth, who is old and had this amazing experience with the temple and the pronouncement from this angel that you're going to have a baby, a miraculous conception. I need to go talk to somebody that understands miraculous conception. I know. I'll go talk to Elizabeth. And so she goes there, enters the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I have a really lame joke that I always plug in here, so get ready for a dad joke. But remember, Elizabeth and Zacharias are Jewish priests, right? They're, they're Jew to the bone. And all of a sudden, Mary comes in and the baby in Elizabeth's womb hears that Jesus is here and he leaps and he dances, right? And we've got these Jewish parents, Elizabeth and Zacharias, and they're going to give birth to a dancing Baptist. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. I dare you not to use it. I bet you do. Anyways. Have you ever seen, and this is one of the beautiful things, right? When somebody is with child and it's like the mom's there and, and you're going along and, and the baby kicks in the womb. Wow, that's exciting, right? And after a while, it's like, here, here, put your hand here. You can feel it. And you're like, whoa, there's something in there, right? And you're like, it's so exciting. Or, or just, they're just, you know, at house and dad comes in and, and just he speaks. And that sound, that baby inside, just reacts to the sound of Daddy's voice. These kinds of things happen, right? And here, this child, miraculous conceived, according to the Word of God, according to the prophecy of God, recognizes that Jesus is in the house. Both these babies still in the womb. Don't tell me that life doesn't begin at conception. And, 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 and there's, there's a lot going on that... We really don't understand. But what we do see and what we know tells us clearly that life is sacred and holy. And so, it leaped in the womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And here we get the first of six songs that Luke records. It's a very short one. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's the song, but it's the first song. 
But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How is it that Elizabeth knows that this is going to be her Lord? This is amazing, right? And again, it's just as God has been speaking and revealing to Zacharias and the prophecies, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture, that uh, she's like, wow, what an honor. The most blessed of women came to my house, right? But why is it granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby weeped and my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Oh, blessed are those who heard and believed. And so, then we see this, this, this wonderful song that Mary breaks out, and it's recorded here. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the song, although I'm probably going to go into more than <laughs> I just said I'm not going to. But remember, when Zacharias heard this news that they're going to be with a child, what happened? He was struck deaf and dumb because of unbelief. And here Mary who says, Be it done unto you, the maid servant of the Lord, in her faith, God doesn't strike her deaf and dumb. God fills her with a song. This is the longest song recorded in the New Testament. It's an amazing song. It has, and it just shows the depth, the spiritual depth of this young girl. Wherever she is, somewhere in her teens, she knows the scripture so well that she's able in these nine verses to string together 20 different quotes from the Old Testament. Uh, she strings, I'm just going to read a quick list. You can do your homework later. But she takes bits and pieces out of 1 Samuel 2, Psalm 34, Psalm 35, Habakkuk 3, Psalm 138, Psalm 71, Psalm 126, Psalm 111, Genesis 17, Exodus 20, Psalm 103, Psalm 98, Psalm 118 again, Psalm 40, Psalm 33, Psalm 41, or Isaiah 41, 1 Samuel 2, Psalm 98, Genesis 17 again, and Psalm 32. All those bits and pieces. And just it just erupts spontaneously out of her heart. It's just, it's beautiful. It's uh, amazing. It has echoes of Hannah's song, right? Who had this miraculous conception. But it has greater width and length and depth and height. I can just imagine how this must be going on in her heart. It's kind of like what Paul says. It comes to the climax in the first part of his letter to the uh, Ephesians, Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, from whom all the family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen? And so look what just erupts out of this young lady's heart. She's there with Elizabeth, and they're just, just rejoicing in the Lord. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. That word magnifies is the word magnificat in the Latin. That's where we get the nickname for this song. It's known as the magnificat, which means to exalt or glorify, to make, make, make magnificent. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. <clears throat> what does this immaculate, sinless woman need a Savior for? Because she's a sinner, just like you and I, and she knows it. We know it. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and his holy name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. Man, this is just amazing. 
Just what comes out of this young girl. You, you can see why God picked her. <laughs> yeah, you're a good candidate. We'll probably go to lunch after this. We're getting up on lunchtime pretty quick here. Let's say you're at whatever your restaurant is, you're with your friends, or maybe let's say I'm with you, okay? And because this happens to me sometimes, and as we're talking, I get a little bit enthusiastic. And some of you may have noticed, sometimes I use my hands when I talk. And I knock over the Diet Coke that's sitting on the table in front of me, okay? It spills all over the table, everybody comes back, grabs some napkins, all that, right? Let me ask you a question, test question. If you're paying attention to my story, what came out of that glass? Good, good. What came out was what was in it. And when you find yourself troubled, agitated, freaking out, when you find the world is throwing a curveball and you're trying to figure out what to do with it, what comes out? We see what comes out of Mary. And I would pray that's who we are. If we are filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be um, drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Colossians 3, we're instructed in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on test tender verses. This is what we fill ourselves up with. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is Mary. This is the song of Mary. This is the Magnificat. Magnifying the Lord with my soul. This is what happens when God shows up. This is what happens when Jesus moves in. And we look in this world that's getting all sideways and hard to figure out and understand. And every time you read the latest news article, you run into the next bitter person. What comes out? Just because you got knocked doesn't mean that you have to react like the one that knocked you. You're a Christian. You're filled with love, hope, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, godliness. This is what God is doing in our hearts. This is what God is birthing in us. This is what is the new creation who's coming out as God indwells us. It says in verse 56, And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Worship team, come on up. I'm going to stop right there. It may take us more than 26 weeks to go through 26 chapters. And yet at the same time, I don't know what the hurry is. As I had mentioned last week, I don't know that we'll be able to finish this, even if we did it in 26 weeks. I don't know that we have that long until Jesus comes back. But in the meantime, I just want to sing His praises. I just want to just see Him move in the world around us. It's such exciting times. You know, we've got so many opportunities. And I, I just pray that we would use this. Mary remained with her about three months, first trimester, right? And returned to her house to face her future. It's wonderful that we've come into this house. This house with Elizabeth. This house with John the Baptist. This house with Zacharias. This house with Gabriel. This house with the promise of God. This house with the Word of God. This house with the Spirit of God. That we are filled with God. But, we've got to return. We've got to go back out into that world 
and say, be it done to your maidservant according to your word. Let us be people that are yielded and humble and ready to go forward and say that name. That name. Salvation. 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 Jesus. Jesus. Right? Jesus. Shout from the house. Father God, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, enfolding us, overshadowing us, that we would be filled to overflowing, that Lord Jesus, we would just open our lips and declare your glory all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.